coming up. Old ICBMs may launch commercial satellites. DARPA's space plane enters phase two. Why have a gravitational wave when you can have a gamma ray burst as well? And we talk about the EM drive, hashtag impossible drive. Stay tuned, tomorrow begins right now. And welcome to tomorrow, episode 9.14 for April 23rd, 2016. And if you are joining us live or on YouTube, welcome to our show. Now let's go ahead and get it started by looking at our tomorrow Patreon premiere members. These folks have given us 10, that's right, $10 per episode for our show to be made. They have access to some awesome stuff, such as our Google Plus, our Google Hangouts, excuse me. Um, also, some of our behind the scenes stuff that we throw up on uh, Patreon. And also, they get instantaneous access to our live show in its entirety, along with the After Dark, immediately as soon as it is posted. And if you folks would like to know how you can do this for our show, you can head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. And we are joined today, not just by myself, Jared Head, the host for you today, because Ben is out doing ITAR Redacted. Uh, we also have the wonderful, the lovely, the beautiful, the not my wife, Carrie Ann Higginbotham, <laughs> right next to me uh, here today. And just to the left, your right, or maybe my right, your left, uh, on the show, we also have Space Mike coming to us live from the mythical land of heat uh, known as Arizona how are you guys doing today, both of you? Doing great, doing Excellent. great. All right. Well, we're actually going to get started with our show, not just talking about heat, but some really hot things that are happening right now. And we're going to throw it to Space Mike to tell us about an interesting plan that not a lot of people may be happy about. Mike, why don't you <laughs> fill us in on that? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of interesting things happening in the, rock, in the rocket industry right now. And one of those things is that Orbital ATK manufactures uh, what they call their Minotaur series of rockets. And we, uh, they, they make these from Minuteman and Peacekeeper motors that were made for ICBMs, or inter Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles. And a lot of those have been decommissioned since the 1990s. Um, and when they use these to make them into their Minotaur line of rockets, uh, they're primarily used for government payloads. And uh, the the use of commercial launches has been banned for the past 20 years. However, the company has been pushing legislators to lift that ban, especially in the 2017 round of, of bills that they're going to be doing, so that they can market the Minotaur series of rockets commercially and internationally to fill the kind of small satellite launch vehicle niche. And uh, the kind of thing with this is they're getting a lot of, of, of uh, opinions on both sides, where uh, certain companies feel kind of threatened, they feel that they would have an un fair advantage if suddenly they were able to get several hundred of these rocket motors to have these. Um, whereas at the same time, uh, the, uh, the, the head of the Air Force Space Command said that he supports this idea if, you know, Orbital ATK or any company that wants to buy these leftover motors would buy them at a, a fair price. And he feels that that would be the, the kind of the factor that would make it fair for all of the companies in this market. And uh, there's lots of small different vehicles, uh, small vehicle launch providers that that are uh, kind of against this plan, most notably Virgin Galactic. Um, at the same time, though, the uh, the House uh, Science uh, Committee, um, or specifically the Space Subcommittee within the House Science Committee in the United States Congress, has been debating this for, for a little while now. And they've gotten several different testimonies and several different opinions, and they haven't reached any sort of clear consensus on it yet. However, most of these lawmakers do agree that, they, that these leftover motors do have worth and should be used in some sort of capacity. And and all of the different skeptics and supporters of this idea alike do want to form some sort of compromise for this. So it's very interesting, and I'm very curious to see how this plays out. And it would be very cool if, if uh, um, Orbital ATK is able to start launching the Minotaur 4 with commercial payloads. So that would, that would just be very cool. Yeah, and I think that would probably help benefit uh, the Air Force as well, because they have to store 
uh, those motors and that propellant, and that is not easy stuff to store, and that can probably get a little expensive um, in the long run as well. So uh, that's, absolutely, that's, thankfully they're not liquid fueled rockets; these are just solid fueled rockets. But still, yes, still there still, is costs involved with with storing them. It so is, absolutely, it is very much an expense um, in making sure that solid motors don't accidentally go off. So. Um. <laughs> well, and Neuropilot in the chat room says he's, I, well, he or she, I suppose, uh, says doubt it will happen because it's essentially handing the U.S. government an ICBM, uh, which is an interesting way of looking at it, I suppose. Yeah, I think as long as it's a U.S. company, they won't have too much of a problem right. handing that over to them. Obviously, ITAR and stuff would, would interfere with, a, inter, with an international company right. um, allowing that to occur. So someone like ATK or even Virgin Galactic could probably purchase um, something like that. So, but yeah, that is a very good point. You are basically getting what was a government missile um, and converting it into use for the commercial sector, which pretty cool. Nice which, way I mean, to they've already that. converted the missile. They've already have you know have several launches under their belt with the Minotaur for different mm -hmm. government launches, and uh, I feel like it would be the same as if you know we were launching a rocket for uh, um, European Space Agency or, mm -hmm. or for anyone. I mean, all these sort of laws exist for to be able to launch you know, international payloads on American rockets. And, you know, there's there's lots of plans and procedures for that. And as long as, you know, the if they're international uh, customers, that they don't get all, of, of course, all of your information and all your blueprints and everything for your rocket. But but there are things in place for that. And if they were to market it, then, you know, of course, they would have to go go through all of that. But uh, I agree that probably if they, if they are successful in this, a lot of their early customers probably would be, you know, United States based. Yeah. Very, very cool. All right. And speaking of some United States-based military <laughs> in space, Carrie Ann, you've got a very interesting story here. I have a DARPA story, you guys. Woo! Yeah, it's because I DARPA. didn't pick it. But, um... <laughs> 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 no, but it, I, I did actually find this one interesting, which is uh, why. Oh, no, I it's a very cool story. I really like it. it. Uh, so DARPA, or the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which the name of the agency is part of their... their uh, what am I trying to say? Anyway, I just was surprised. It, I suppose DARP. Just saying you're part of DARP is kind of silly. Anyhow, so the U.S. Defense <laughs> Advanced Research Projects Agency uh, announced April 7th, actually, at Space Access, uh, which I believe was in Phoenix, if I remember correctly, a Space Access 16 conference, that mm -hmm. uh, phase two of their experimental space plane, or the XS-1 program, they're moving forward into phase two, is what I'm trying to say. <sighs> Goodness, thank you. Uh, so phase two is going on to develop a prototype uh, of a reusable first stage combined with an expendable upper stage to launch small and medium-sized satellites for less than $5 million. They're going to do the phase two award in 2017. Uh, phase one contracts initially went to Boeing, Maston Space Systems, and Northrop Grumman, but phase two will be open to any company uh, that is willing to develop their designs and enter into flight testing. They need to demonstrate flying 10 times in 10 days, which is a huge, huge deal yeah. all the way around. Just a bit. Yeah. Uh, at least one flight has to carry a faux payload of 400 to 680 kilograms. Test flights have to be done by 2020. And uh, like I said, phase two is completely open. It's not restricted to just phase one participants. Uh, DARPA is putting in $140 million into the development of phase two, but that may not be enough to fully fund it. In fact, pretty much everyone has said that it's not going to be enough to fully fund <laughs> phase two, which is making some people a little bit upset set uh notably boeing per se of them saying well that's great i mean we'll probably still work on it but we're just not gonna put as many people on it is essentially what they've come down to which is really kind of an interesting idea all the way around yeah um but yeah no so that's that's really interesting uh i yeah uh, all the way around space plane space plane stuff ben gets really really excited about space plane stuff so i i can i bet he's just itching right now to yeah. say something about it and of course we said the words mastin yes. as well yeah. Mastin space which system, means that which my is... heart fluttered a little bit yeah i think <laughs> the, the collective tomorrow heart sort of fluttered all the way around <laughs> yeah. uh, about that uh just start to 1701 in the chat room is asking do all 10 flights have to go to orbit i don't believe so uh but they do have to fly 10 times in <laughs> in 10 days uh we have a disappointed ben graph if you want to go ahead and fill that up. There he is. Uh, <laughs> that's amazing. We can pretend that that's live even though it's not, but it's that's really amazing. I'm pretty sure it's the exact same face he's making right now anyway, so just, just pretend like that's true. Oh, goodness gracious. Uh, yeah. Did I see somebody else in the chat room say something about who is Mastin? 
Is that right? Or my my chat room is all crazy pants all over the place right Maybe. Now? But yeah, right. the 10 flights, basically the XS1 is supposed to be like a rapid deployable kind of thing where you launch the XS1 and there's actually a, a way to deploy the payload to orbit from the XS1 and the XS1 goes suborbital. Um, and then at the peak of its suborbital flight, I guess, at Apogee with the highest point, pew, you launch a second stage and it can carries that payload. Um, up into orbit. So the XS1 itself does not go to orbit, but it does, it is sort of a critical part of getting things that the military wants to have up very quickly in orbit. So um, very interesting program, 10 times in 10 days. That's an incredible launch cadence. Yeah, so that's, that's beyond Russian launch cadence. That's beyond Chinese launch cadence. That's beyond pretty much so. any cadence other than a plane, a plane plane. Wow. Oh, <laughs> I was punny. Because it's a space Mark plane. Mark this day down. Because it's a space plane. <laughs> wow. April 23rd, 2016, the day the pun arrived. Yep. There Amazing. you go. Fantastic. Goodness, yeah. get off of this. Let's well, move on. Sure, moving <laughs> on, because we are talking about the environment, of course, because we just had Earth Day this Yay. past week. So, woohoo, this planet that we're on. We only get one. Um, so, we've got environmental testing underway on a satellite called JPSS-1. And you may be wondering, what the heck does JPSS-1 terrible acronym. stand for? It is a very bad acronym. <laughs> um, it stands for Joint Polar Satellite System 1. So this is the first spacecraft in the Joint Polar Satellite System. And nice. it's called the Joint Polar Satellite System because this is a collaboration between NASA and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, N-O-A-A. -A. Now the tests that they are performing on the spacecraft include vacuum chambers, thermal loads, systems testing, and vibration tests as well. Now it's going to be launched into an orbit 820 kilometers above the Earth at an inclination of 98.7 degrees. Now it will study weather, environmental factors, and it will help improve meteorological understanding and models that we do. So in other words, it's going up there to look at the weather from a very close platform and, may, and help us understand why weather does what weather does. And from doing that, we'll also understand environmental problems and maybe some climate change issues and some other wonderful things that we get to do with a space-based platform like that. Now, what I'm very excited about is that it will launch on the penultimate Delta II, and they already have the launch set for January 20th, 2017 at 947 Coordinated Universal Time, which for those of us who live here in California, where it will launch at Vandenberg Air Force Base, means that it will launch at 147 in the morning. So um, get yourself up early, get your coffee going. I'm going to be there for sure, um, and I can't wait to see that. So. Oh, that's going to be... I just realized that's the day after my birthday. Yeah. Well, hey, let's have let's go have a birthday dinner for you, and then we'll take you to the launch. As long can... as we have the birthday dinner down here, sure. and then go up to the launch. Sure. <laughs> Is that going to be okay with everyone? Sure. And then a, yeah, I'm okay with that. There's a McDonald's in Lone Poke. No, no, up by not Vandenberg. Not for my 40th birthday. Okay, it's not going to happen. <laughs> okay. Why does everyone try to ruin that? Okay. Okay. That's fine. Okay. All right. Now. Then yeah, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, speaking it's of to be put, the last Delta II launch, right? Second to last. Second oh, to last man. Delta II launch. So the oh, last one will come later sad. in the year. Actually, I think the last one is scheduled for Halloween 2017. Oh, that'll so. be awesome. We can all dress up like rockets. Yeah, let's. Oh my <laughs> gosh, I have a great idea. Let's do a Carrie Ann just said. <laughs> we'll show up as rockets. Because there was somebody, when I went to the Falcon 9 launch in January, the mm. last Falcon 9 1.1. There was somebody dressed as a Falcon 9 out there. Nice. Like, I'm not kidding. There was cool. somebody. And I wanted to, like, put him in a headlock and be like, you're a nerd. Give me your lunch money. So uh, <laughs> some really cool stuff uh, with as, that there. As a, as a fat kid, I call Falcon Heavy. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. You get to have it. So you get to have it. I'll be a Black Brant, one of the sounding rockets, because I have a very aerodynamic kick <laughs> to my head. So, all right. Enough of this. Um, speaking of rockets, which is what we're talking about, uh, let's throw Sword. it to Mike here because he's going to talk about an interesting type of propulsion. Mike, 
Yeah. Tell us Even though I'm this. sad about the Delta II retiring, I'm very excited about uh, better rockets, or not necessarily rockets. What we're actually talking about here is ion thrusters. Aerojet Rocketdyne has received a contract from NASA that's worth about $67 million to develop an advanced version of what's what's formerly known as a Hall thruster. And I don't mean formerly like prior, I mean like, like people, you know, that's a very formal thing to say. Sorry. Um, with, this, <laughs> with these Hall thrusters that Aerojet has been commissioned to make, they want these to be much more powerful than the traditional uh, um, ion engines that are used today. And with this, we actually have an example of several different tests of, of ion engines Ooh. that have gone through. <laughs> yeah, very pretty wow. looking. Wow. <laughs> Where can I get one of these? Well, Aerojet Rocket Giant makes some and several other companies as well, Boeing notably, but with the Aerojet one, this whole contract is to double the thrust of today's ion thrusters. And with this, they want to be able to have something that uses xenon gas. And so that, you know, has it passing through an electric field to generate the thrust and, and isn't like uh, some more uh, unconventional plasma thrusters. But what they want to do is have advances in fuel efficiency and thrust that are vital to future missions that would be able to send humans to Mars because they need to be able to send a lot of different cargo and infrastructure before humans would ever set foot on the surface of Mars. Uh, but not only that, the objective of all this is to practice the different procedures and demonstrate technologies such as the advanced uh, electric propulsion systems and also the large solar arrays to power it. What NASA wants to do is with the, the um, ARM mission for Asteroid Redirect, they want to have a solar electric propulsion that would be able to generate 300 kilowatts of electricity. And with that, they would be able to power large clusters of these different ion engines together so that they could have something that would be fairly efficient but a little bit faster than uh, some previous pros like uh, NASA's Dawn or New Horizons missions that had ion engines on them. And so with that, they would be able to send you know, a large amount of mass to whatever destinations they're going to and take advantage of, of the increased thrust that you get from ion engines the longer that you leave them on. And with the different studies that NASA is doing, they're um, uh, working with Orbital ATK and a company called Deployable Space Systems on a lot of these advanced large solar arrays that would be able to be used for systems like this. So I'm very excited about this and I'm, and, uh, I'm hopeful that they're able to achieve the goals that NASA has set forth for them. Um, this contract lasts 36 months and it's also going to include options for uh, potential purchases of these ion engines if they're successful with this. So hopefully everything goes well with that. and. Uh, I guess we're just going to have to wait and see about three years of whether or not they're going to be successful with this or not. But I'm wishing them all the luck. Oh, I, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask, what did they, I, just if you could repeat, what was the efficiency that they were going to have in comparison to current ion engines? What was they're looking for. They're looking for double the amount of thrust, and as for okay. efficiency, that has more to do with the solar panels and the amount of le electricity they're able to generate. Mm -hmm. Because in theory, you know, if you if you can pump a lot of energy into an ion engine, and so long as you don't run out of its its fuel, in this case xenon, then you can actually ramp them up pretty high to have a pretty good um, I ISP in space. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's where it all comes into how much power you're able to generate. And you can only do so much with the uh, um, RTGs, the, uh, the radioactive uh, generators that, that some spacecraft are equipped with. Yeah. So it all kind of goes fr uh, from there. And that's where uh, I think they're going to be relying on other companies to, to help with that work. Yeah, and just to give uh, some people some specs, um, there is a spacecraft right now called Dawn, which is around Dwarf Planet series that uses ion engines. Um, its ion engines have a specific impulse of 3,100 seconds, um, and they generate a thrust of 90 micronewtons. So um, <laughs> essentially what I was told is that the thrust of Dawn's ion engines is that if you put a piece of paper on your hand, the amount of force that that, pe that single sheet of paper is exerting is how much thrust that the ion engine has at full throttle. Um, but of course you can leave that engine on for years at a time, which means you can build up speed. Um, uh, Dawn is something like zero to 60 miles per hour in three days, I think, um, which isn't fast. But no, then again, but, I mean, you, leave it on for a year, yeah, and you get some incredible get velocity change with that there. Huh. So it's already at 3,100 seconds of impulse. How do you get any better than that? That's ridiculous, just <laughs> as it is. I love this, this idea that they have. Um, 
with it here. And just to give you an idea, um, rocket engines at best can pull like 470, 480 seconds of impulse. So we're already talking like nine times more, uh, nine times better, if you will, than rocket engines or ch chemical propulsion, excuse me, yeah. um, with that there. Um, so whew, that is some mind blowing stuff. Uh, that we and, and this is just part of a much larger, um, I'm, I'm seeing questions in the cat, uh, excuse me, chat room. This is just part of a much larger study that NASA is doing for advanced propulsion concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, the Vasimir engine is also part of this uh, um, uh, sort of concepts that NASA is uh, putting research and development money, money into. So, Yeah, very, very cool. They, they want to have something, though, for all the at least the asteroid redirect missions and definitely a lot of the future ideas for Mars missions as well. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mike. That is just an unbelievable, uh, unbelievable work that they're doing in order to get that going. Exciting, too, and also very pretty as well yeah <laughs> um, with it there. Now, speaking of stuff that nasa is working on carrie Ann, you've got a really cool thing that nasa is actually doing right now right now like right now right now 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 like if you're not watching us which you should be but if you're not watching us live then maybe you should be watching this instead yes uh this is the Na nasa space apps challenge 2016. uh this is actually the fifth year it's been going on so if you maybe feel like you've heard about it before this is a whole nother year of doing it it's one of the largest hackathons on the entire planet planet, which I didn't realize. Uh, just last year, there were 14,264 people gathered in 133 different locations wow. because you can basically do it anywhere that you've got Wi-Fi. Yeah, you could just remote in. Totally. Pretty so cool. and you so you can create your own group locally or you can join another group from far, far away, which is really amazing. There's six different categories. There's technology, aeronautics, space station, solar system and Earth, as well as journey to Mars with their each own little hashtag like tech exploration, fly NASA, be an astronaut. Out, out there, there, which is my favorite, Earth right now, <laughs> and of course, hashtag journey to Mars. They got really creative with that one. Uh, they, they, uh, <laughs> NASA provides not just contacts and hashtags, but they also have data and resources. And this that's the whole idea, is that NASA just has this huge data pool, or almost like a data dump, and they're like, here, bleh, do something. And then you get a chance to do something with it, which I think is a really, really cool How idea. How did they do it again? And bleh, yeah, that's totally going to be... <laughs> I know, I should never have done that in the first place, but that's what happens when you watch live. Anyway, uh, so you can work in a team or individually, which is really great, uh, and from, again, virtually just about anywhere. You're solving challenges using real data. That's the other thing. Uh, and the other thing is, is it's not just sort of, uh, how, how do I word this without getting myself into too much trouble. All the challenges are completely different. And there's easy, intermediate, and advanced challenges. So if you've never done coding before, or if like you are a known hacker, there's usually something that you can find. And there's all different kinds of challenges, which I think is really interesting. You can win an award in one of six categories as well. There's best use of data, people's choice, galactic impact, awesome, most inspirational, best mission concept, and best use of hardware. You can also go back and look at other challenges and cool. uh, you know what's happening and what's going on. You can pretty much join in at any given point in time. That's awesome. They, are, again, are all over the world, and there's 42 of them that are streaming live. So if you get bored with Pakistan, I suppose you can tap into San Francisco or Zurich or Austria or you know pick a place. There's probably one, and it's probably interesting. Uh, and the live stream, the uh, uh, social media stream that's coming off of those things is really incredible. Some places have shirts and patches and stickers and others are like, we're going for a coffee break. And it's really a lot of fun. A lot of fun. I think it's very cool. Nice. There you go. I like it. Yay. Very awesome. Now I want to go make an app. I know, I'm right? <laughs> All different kinds of things. You can be like, ah, the best way to put on your space boots in zero G. Let's like that could be a whole thing. There's an app for that. Well, there will be now. So, there will be now. So there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I guess we're going to have to take phones with us to, into space mm, and into maybe. Mars and stuff. That might be a little difficult. Yeah. So I can get on my boots manually. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't need a, I don't need to take a photo and have my, my Roomba do it for me or something like that. Um, anyways, moving on. Yes. Um, because there is something very interesting that has just recently been announced. It was sort of announced back in January, but then people were like, no, not really. But then the scientists were like, yes, yes, actually. Um, so 
we all know about the gravitational wave that was discovered um, by LIGO, which LIGO, for those of you who want to know what it stands for, is Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. This is the one we listen to, right? Sound like a heartbeat? Yeah, it kind of sounds like a heartbeat yes. a little bit. It's, it's not so much you hear it, it's just we just made it so that you could sound like... You could hear it in the human hearing range if you want to. Right. Um, but we discovered it back on September 14th, 2015, and that was the first direct detection of a gravitational wave. It was two black holes, approximately 30 times the mass of the sun, merging together. And because LIGO only had two detectors, we basically had to best guess where it was in the sky. And that's what those little blue and green slivers you see um, right there are. Now, interesting thing. Fermi, NASA's gamma ray observatory in low Earth orbit, detected a gamma ray burst from within that best guess of sky within half a second after the, the detection of the gravitational wave by LIGO. So the chances of that happening by coincidence are 0.2%. They actually crunched the numbers and they figured nice. out. So it's a 1 in 500 chance that that just so happened to happen. Well, what they did is that the gamma ray burst detection was at a very high angle relative to where Fermi was. So they actually didn't accurately know where that burst came from. But they know the direction that the instrument was looking, which was in red there, and they know the part that the Earth was blocking as huh. well. So that yellow space is the field where that potentially could have come from. So they think that the gravitational wave could have come from that yellow area that you see right there. And this is sort of like a luck of the draw, and it actually ends up narrowing down that field two-thirds in size. So it's only about 30% as big as the original field of where the space that the gravitational wave could have come from was. Um, now, in the future, because they are making more gravitational wave observatories, We'll have three, so we can triangulate its position very easily. But this was just basically the best we could do with the two detectors at LIGO that were sensitive enough to actually pick up that gravitational wave. Now, this is a little weird because they would have expected two black holes merging together to have a clean area around them. In other words, the black hole's gravity would have basically ate, if you will, everything around it, like the gases and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it should be just a clean merger of two black holes. This, with a gamma ray burst, indicates that there might have been some gas around, which is unexpected. So they may have to go back and look at their models and see what happens when they throw gas around in it and see if it actually does turn up a result like what we got. So they're fairly confident that that gamma ray burst actually was from those two black holes merging, which means that maybe gamma ray bursts aren't just the birth of black holes, but maybe they're also black holes merging together as well. So uh, some very interesting stuff that we originally thought was wrong, but actually turned out to be correct if you will. Um, but of course, they're going to study it a little bit This isn't a thing. Oh, wait, more. this is a thing. No, this isn't a thing. No, this is a thing. It is. No, it's <laughs> not. But it is. But it isn't. But it is not. Is, isn't. Yes. <laughs> All right. And of course, speaking of things that is and is not at the same time, when we come back, we are going to be talking about the EM drive, the impossible drive, the thing that defies physics. And we will come back to that. We're going to talk about it. We're going to, most of us, probably learn about it uh, today and hopefully wrap our brains around the physics that allow that to apparently exist. So we'll be right back, and we'll see you in just a second. And welcome back from that break. Before we get into our topic today, we are going to go back and take a look at some of our Patreon patrons. We're going to start with our TMRO premiere members. These folks gave $10 or more to us per episode so they get access to all the amazing things that we talked about earlier. But of course, we also have our TMRO producers as well. These folks gave us $5 in order to have their names not only just in the show, uh, but also they get access as well to things like after dark immediately in our Google Hangouts and all the other fun goodies that come with being a TMRO uh, patron. 
on our Patreon. So if you would like to consider donating to our Patreon, please go to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. And we absolutely love the fact that everybody gets to play their part in making this show happen. We wouldn't have the show without you guys. So that's the great part about it. So we totally. really do. We love you from the bottom of our hearts and the top and the left and the right. So it's all true. over it. I was there. Yeah, it is. <laughs> all right. So what we are going to do now is we are going to get into something that is unbelievably controversial and amazingly incomprehensible, but also at the same time physically understandable, but not at the same time as well. <laughs> Um, I, I actually have it written in the rundown. These are not really talking points. These are just things that I gleaned from a couple of articles, and you guys are going to have to explain this to me. Yeah. This, <laughs> I, you know, I work in propulsion for rockets. I don't even understand how this thing works. I have, like, a, like I can scratch the surface on it, but I'm just like, well, what? Um, so we're going to talk about so, this. And I guess, Space Mike, you're the most well-versed person in this, we're, of course, talking about the EM drive, which if you haven't heard about it, here it is. Um, it looks absolutely terrible. It looks like it somebody... It looks like a medieval, like, torture device is what it looks like, like. Somebody went to, like, a dumpster at NASA and was like, <laughs> what can we do with all these things? I don't know. Maybe we'll just throw it together and see what it does. Um, it literally looks like something you would make in Kerbal Space Program as a joke. <laughs> But it's an actual thing that apparently does something. Um, and Mike, why don't you go ahead and fill us well, in on this? Because this is an unbelievably complex... I mean, my brain is just hurting right now well, trying to get us into this. I'm not sure that I understand the physics 100%, but I try, I try to understand it in the same way that um, kind of the ion engines or, or, or plasma engines work. You know, they create an electrical field and charge up the ions um, from whatever noble gas they're using. And, you know, those, those uh, ions moving around and, and being pushed out is what, what generates thrust for them. And this is a little bit different. It's not just an electrical field, but they're also creating a magnetic field. And they use a, a device called, um, I, I know I'm not going to pronounce this uh, properly, but I believe that it is called a magnetrometer. And essentially, it's like a really fancy microwave that would be able to uh, <laughs> help to generate a very, very small, very minuscule magnetic field with the, this microwave. And with that, there's also a little bit of radiation in there as well. And from the way that I understand it, from the way that a lot of these studies have been put out, I mean, the first guy who did this was a British scientist named Rod Roger Sawyer, who prevented this concept way back in 1999. And... The whole thing with this EM drive is, like in the way that ion engines produce a very small amount of thrust, the difference between them is that ion engines need a fuel like xenon or argon or something like that in order to, to, to have the whole process work. But with this EM drive, there is no fuel. There is no propellant. They're essentially creating this thrust from nothing. Be able, yes, being, being able to have you know, uh, electricity and uh, these microwave beams going through it, but there's no other fuel. It's a reactionless engine. And the whole process with this is that we kind of have a graphic here that, that kind of shows an idea. Ooh, it's pretty Inside, in, inside of the shape of, of uh, this, this, this uh, canister that they, that they have here, this cone that they have here, they are having different amounts of, of microwaves in the different areas of this cone. And you can kind of see how, how the back of it has, is, is heated up. What they try to do is to have the most amount of it in one area and a lesser amount in another area. This also goes to the concept of that light has mass. And if light has mass, then it should potentially have inertial mass. And if it's being bounced around by all these microwaves and everything inside of this cone, in order to not violate the law of, con of con conserving momentum, then it would need to produce a, a little bit of thrust in order to, to keep a constant while it's being bounced around inside of this cone. And that is what creates the thrust that these things are, are generating. At least that's what the people working on it think. And I don't even understand the concept fully and the thing is, is some of the people working on this say, oh, it doesn't violate the law of physics at all. It's just kind of like a weird exception. And other theorists are just like, no, this would have to be a completely new physics in order for this to work. The thing is, is that there's eight different teams working on, on this, this idea on, on, and actually testing it, that has built models and is testing it. And 
some of them uh, of these of the tests that have occurred some of them have produced nothing because they're trying all sorts of different message uh, methods excuse me and also the shape of the cone and some of them are just doing flat can uh, uh, canisters and some of them are putting grooves and rivets into it and they're having all sorts of varied results but the problem is is that the majority of all of these different tests or n not majority but but more than 60% of these tests have been able to measure a very small minuscule amount of thrust and and even if even if the theorists themselves don't understand what's happening, there is that thrust, and it still could be you know an error in the sensors because what we're talking about is so small that it could you know I'm sure that there could be plenty of reasons why they could be able to have an error like that to 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 measure those very small minuscule amounts of thrust but because they are getting this thrust then and and by the way this is just a little bit of electricity that is being pumped into these things with a large amount of electricity they're thinking that with the results that are getting so far that they could potentially get something going around as fast as like 0.4 newtons of thrust per kilowatt and when you bring this kind of into the idea of, of NASA's advanced propulsion that they're looking at, wanting to have a 300 kilowatt solar electric propulsion uh, capable uh, craft. If you were to apply to one of these drives to something like that and have 300 kilowatts of available electricity, then you might be able to generate quite a bit of thrust and have something that could potentially, we're, we were earlier talking about the aerojet ion thruster that would be twice the amount of thrust as uh, normal ion thrusters. But if this is works out to, you know, if it scales up to what they've been looking at so far, then it could be seven times more thrust than an ion engine and with no fuel. So you have an extremely light engine and you could do so many amazing things. Just some of the examples in uh, some of the other people working on it, there's another scientist named Mike McCullough who actually disagrees with a lot of the original scientists' uh, theories as to how this, this could possibly work. But in one of his papers, he gives a lot of really, really good examples of how this could be applied and that journeys to Mars or even journeys to Saturn could be two years or less. But in any case, I'm sorry, I'm kind of dominating the conversation here, but that's the way that I understand it. Yeah, there, it is incredibly complex um, to the point of, of total madness, um, if you will. And I was reading that some of the forces that they're getting out of it are like in the micro-Newton range. I mean, mm -hmm. this is just mm -hmm. unbelievable immensely small i mean like like point zero with like eight zeros and then a number there newtons that's absurdly small um to measure it's measurable um and also i'm seeing that a lot of these experiments that they're doing are taking into account things like the fluctuation of air because of the heat being generated from the uh, magneto or the magnometer or whatever it's called um <laughs> from the from the system uh there we go yeah. that clears it up um and it's just it's unbelievable because it really is one of those things that physics says no. But for some reason, you've got multiple teams who are picking, who are at least saying that they are testing it and f confirming that there is a small amount of force um, coming for it, from it. Now, one of the problems, though, is that not many of these have been peer-reviewed. And that's a really big issue in science. Um, for those of you who don't know what the peer review process is, basically, if you're a scientist, you do your work, you do your research, and then you write up a report um, from your experimentation that proves your hypothesis or disproves it somehow. Um, and then what you do, you publish that report, and you send it to like a journal or a magazine or something like that, or a place where everyone in your field can have access to it. And then people from your field grab your report, they look at your procedures, they perform your experiment based upon your procedures, and they try to see if they can get a similar result. So that's essentially what happens. If they get a similar result, well, bam, you know, good job, you did your experiment correctly, all good. If there's a thousand people that do appear in your peer review that do the experiment 500 of them do it do it and they get the same result 500 of them do it and they all get a different result you got to go back to the drawing board and you got to redo your experiment and that's not an unusual thing because uh, honestly as a scientist if you're not going back to the drawing board you're probably doing lots of things wrong because uh, very rarely do you hit the home run out of the park or, or do you get it right on the first shot yeah. um, with your with your experiment right there um, now an interesting thing, though, about peer review is that if you have a thousand people do it and 999 people do it and prove you correct, but one person proves you wrong, 
you got to go back to the drawing board and you got to do it again because somebody has found a valid point that you are incorrect. So peer review is an immensely, immensely important part of the scientific method and the process by which we actually prove and disprove or prove disproves uh, of things as well involved in science. And, you know, there was a lot of uh, tension, if you will, from some of the teams about getting their results peer reviewed. A lot of them were sort of, don't want to necessarily say opposed, um, but they've been extremely slow uh, to get their results uh, peer reviewed as well. And, and I and believe- Some of them were even just self-publishing their uh, papers like on their websites and something like that. And even the NASA Eagle yeah. Works project, which has been working on it for a couple of years, just submitted their peer review. So. I mean, yes, it's been going pretty slow. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's peer review is all basically about replication. Can is there successful replication of the results? Is it consistent? Is it concise? And is it understandable in the framework that we have built in terms of physics and things like that? Um, but from what I understand, they are actually moving some of these towards peer review now. They're actually going to be releasing some of the data on these and the experiments and the procedures um, from them. And we're going to actually, probably within the next six months to a year, find out whether, yes, it's correct, um, or no, it defies physics, which a lot of people are pointing to the no, physics says you can't do that. Um, because let's face it, it's really hard to break physics in our universe. We've tried to do it, um, <laughs> but I, I personally have not broken physics yet. Carrie Ann or Space Mike, I don't know about you guys. Have you guys? Yeah, I, I, I don't have a debug menu, unfortunately. No, no, unfortunately <laughs> we don't. Um, but, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting study that's happening, at least, and I feel like it's a pretty neat idea. How neat is that? Yeah. It's pretty neat um, with it right there. So, um, and you know, if we do end up proving it, awesome. We, you know, we've got a, a, a potential system that we can use as a form of propulsion that may end up taking us and turning us into an interstellar species. Um, if we don't, well, we had a nice moment in history where we can all look back and laugh uh, for a little bit of time about it, I guess. Uh, so some very, very interesting research to say the least on an unbelievably complicated thing uh, that we have going on with the EM drive. So do we have anything from our chat room um, just to add in here or? So much. Is so everyone much in our chat room, room just as confused as we are um, about that? Actually, or? no, because uh, Aeronaut actually uh, had some interesting things to say. Let me see if I can scroll back up. And yeah, let's go ahead and take a look it. at it. By the way, uh, you guys are correct which is that photons, um, do, they don't technically have mass, but they do have momentum. So that, that is correct. So that's why you can use things like a solar sail in order to move your spacecraft um, if you want to, because the momentum is, a little bit of momentum is transferred in the collision of a photon against that, um, which suppose you could also use that accelerating a photon, if you will, um, to, to generate that as well. Um, but yeah, it's so amazing. <laughs> so Aeronaut, the best part is Aeronaut starts off with, it's simple. Uh, there's no such thing as a complete vacuum. In such, you are, cha you are charging what is available in the vacuum. Mm -hmm. You cannot have an empty vacuum. It's just not possible. Um, and then Very goes true. on to say, Einstein's equations allow for it in special relativity. Mm -hmm. The rest mass uh, of photons is, is massless, massless, but the ideal... In but this is ideal, ideal and, and not, not approximate. approximate. So that's why I said right. they kind of don't have mass. It goes on to say so. the set of equations can be re represented by capital E equals PC for bosons or uh, fo with, or mass, bosons. photons. Yes. Right. Blah, blah, blah. Lots of people said lots of other things. In other things. words, it's complicated. And then also yeah. Aeronaut throws in peer review is the curse. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, do we have a live feed of Ben? Thinking, uh, probably, thinking about uh, he's on a plane now, so he probably is watching. I'd imagine. We have a live feed of Ben thinking about it. Oh, see there, there he is. Go. He's very happy about There's it. There's the happy Ben. Oh, <laughs> happy Ben is, is he, happy. Is he using an EM drive in order to move? Because I don't see a system <laughs> there um, allowing him to do that. So, oh goodness, um, goodness. Yeah. Oh man, it is. This is great. The best part is that you guys have comments and you're going to yes. have comments. Please leave us comments and then Ben will answer all of them next week. You absolutely <laughs> should do that. Because <laughs> I want to see Ben sweating bullets about hardcore theoretical physics. Because yeah, that's what this is. Who doesn't? 
Because you can't, us. you can't tell, but I'm sweating bullets right now just talking about this because my brain is like, that's enough of that. Uh, so and I feel like 50% of what I just said is false, but I don't even know the difference. But we're not sure. <laughs> Nobody knows. That's the amazing part about the EM drive. Nobody knows really. Not even the scientists. <laughs> yeah. Except for the people that are actually working on it. And then even some of the people that are working on it are like, we don't know. I don't, I don't know how it's working. But We're yeah. pretty much in the matrix on so, this one. So it's obviously, okay. Um, <laughs> I think we can all agree that it's basically magic. It's sorcery. Right? It's sorcery. It's witchcraft. I mean, if you threw it in a lake, it would probably float. Right? <laughs> so. Wow. Talk about an inside so, joke. All right. There we go. All right. And now that we've done that, why don't we go ahead and head to a break? Um, of course, as Carrie Ann said, leave your comments below about the EM drive if you can. Leave some math in the comments if you want to, so then I can go home and derive it and learn a little bit. Um, or just put in the comments that we had no clue what we were talking about because, hey, need to do the people working on it. So, um, mm -hmm. anyways. <laughs> Might as well. That way oh. we can learn together. <laughs> All right. So now that we've insulted everybody, let's go ahead and head to break. And when we come back, your comments about last week's show, Vote for Space. So see you in just a couple of minutes. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for man. The exploration of space will go ahead whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. And welcome back, everybody. We are glad to have you after that break for the last part of our show. But before we do that, let's go show you some more of our Patreon patrons that we have. These are our TMRO Premier members. These folks have given us $10 or more per episode. And when you do that, not only do you get great stuff, but you get your name in the show three times. How awesome is that? And in addition to our TMRO Premier members, we also have our TMRO producers as well. They are wonderful people who have given us $5 or more, and they have access to everything, and they get their names twice in the show. But of course... What if you don't want to actually give that much per episode? Well, that's fine. You're more than welcome to. We have our tomorrow Patreon Plus subscribers. These folks have given us $2.50 or more per episode. They get access to all the goodies, and they get their names once on the episode, and we still absolutely love everything they get to do. But if you don't want to do that, you could give us as little as a penny per episode, and that will get your name in the show. These are our Patreon patrons who have given us a penny or more between that, and they get their name in the show here. Try to see if you can see your name with the small print. Uh, I, can, I can just barely make it out from right here. But, of course, we want to thank everybody who gives to us through our Patreon. If you would like to do so on a per episode basis for the live shows, please go to patreon.com slash TMRO and you can help make the shows of tomorrow happen today. So we're gonna go ahead and get into our comments 
from last week's show, which was a very interesting topic called Vote for Space, where we actually had a political action committee that specifically works to advocate for uh, the government to vote for space. So let's go ahead and go to some of our comments here. Yay. Capcom, let's Yay. get it started with our first comment that we have right here. This first comment comes off of Reddit. This one comes from Brandon Mark saying, I like Ben's daydream on marrying SpaceX's first stage reusability plan to ULA's second stage reusability plan. Just curious, what would it take a ULA ACES, which is Advanced Cryogenic Evolved Stage, atop a SpaceX Falcon 9 first stage? Technically, I mean, leaving out the politics, money, posturing, negotiating, egos, and all of that, just in terms of hardware, would it be possible? Hmm. Sure, absolutely. All yeah. it would take is a, is a, is like a, an adapter fairing or something mm -hmm. like that, because yeah. the Falcon 9 first stage is uh, 3.6 uh, meters in diameter, whereas the Asus upper stage is planned to be a little bit over 5 meters in diameter. So it would kind of be like a Titan 3 type stack where they have <laughs> a skinny uh, a rocket on the bottom and then a really wide adapter for a huge payload fairing on the top. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, technically they could do it, and uh, uh, that's that's probably what it would take. You could, yeah. And, you know, like they were saying at the Space Symposium in Colorado just a couple weeks ago, ULA, um, Tori Bruno said that he would have no problem collaborating with SpaceX at some point in the future. So, who knows? Maybe that was, maybe that was a little hint. Um, uh, yeah, let's cross everything <laughs> up in order to make yeah. that happen. Because that would be really, uh, really, really great. All right, so... Capcom, can we see our next comment, please? This is a great comment by a name I'm totally going to butcher, so I apologize in advance. Whoa, that's a great name. And this one comes off of YouTube. <laughs> it's from, oh, goodness, put the slate up. I can't, you don't watch me suffer through this. Polko. It's, we'll just say Polko. It's, okay, Polkov Niknades. Yeah? Polkov, Polkov Niknades. Polkov Niknades who says, hey, I'm from Australia, and me and my friends love watching what NASA and the U.S. launch industry does. Is there a way that I, as a non-U.S. citizen, can help out with U.S. space politics? I'm sure many, many other international viewers share the same sentiment. Ooh. And the really awesome thing is, while we don't even have to answer this one, because... <laughs> We didn't have to answer this one because yeah. our guest from last week, who was representing VoteForSpace.com, answered it for us. So... Thank you, John. I will now read part of your comment back to Polkov Niknades. John says, or Vote for Space says, if you really want to help with U.S. politics, you can email volunteer at voteforspace.com and we'll have a discussion about additional research that can that you can help me in facilitating other grassroots organizations to take action. I'll forward you some of the conversations I've been having so that you can see the type of foresight that needs to go into mounting a campaign and research that needs to be done to support it. And then, once we got all of that information into our uh, our timeline for the show, then Lisa Stojanovsky, who's one of our correspondents, mm -hmm. Lisa got up at stupid times of the day to actually put in another little tidbit because she is also from Australia and there's a thing going on right now. So for for all of you Australian viewers, all two of you, you could... <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a little bit more than that. Maybe so. three. Uh, <laughs> there's uh, an actually going on is there's a review of the Aussie space law that's going on right now. So what you can do is you can hit up http slash tiny dot cc slash Australia space, all one word. Mm -hmm. I would give you the longer link, but it's totally not worth it. We would be here for days. So tiny, T-I-N-Y dot cc slash Australia space, and there's a form you can fill out. You can give your opinion, which is really amazing. I'm super jealous. And uh, you can, you know, talk about, thank you, uh, Sir Game A Lot. A couple people put it out to our chat room. You can talk about how you feel about Aussie space law, what's going on, how you think, you know, is it still applicable, and uh, what you would like to see in the future, which is really, really incredible. And for, again, for those of you who are here in the U.S., of course, go ahead and visit VoteForSpace.com and kind of get that going. It was really kind of amazing to see all of this happen. Mm -hmm. We had the guest on. Somebody, you know, made mention of it. Somebody said this, and then this other thing. It was really incredible. This is why we do this show. Yep. If I may just sort of you know, gather all of my Ben Credible with me for a nanosecond. This is exactly why. We want to make sure that we are hopefully bringing some information to you guys to help us learn, of course, like our main topic today. 
Ahem. <laughs> And then help you learn and get involved in the things that you know and love. So this was really amazing. Thank you guys so much. This uh, such an awesome. Ben actually used the word synergy, and he hates that word because it's totally cohesion. It's a crap word all the way around, but it actually worked this time mm -hmm. with uh, how well all of that worked out. So I thought that was very, very cool. Yes. Excellent. Well, <sighs> How's that? Sounds good. Let's <laughs> move on. So yeah. That was a great soapbox. Yes. Box. Thank you, thank you. Great. Round of applause. Uh, yeah, that was all. That was all, Ben. Yeah, he, his soapbox will be back when he uh, when he comes back. All right. Well, Capcom, let's go to one more comment for us oh, for this one show. More time. Okay. So this last uh, comment also comes off of YouTube. This is from Kim Peterson, and saying, "Quote: Speaking of man crushes, I think I have a non-gender specific crush on the Tomorrow Show. Oh." I'm medicated right now, but I'm still fairly certain it's real, uh, which is hilarious. And it, Kim, for the <laughs> Kim, for those of you who don't know who Kim Peterson is, because it's kind of a generic name, so I can understand you may not, is uh, head of the Monorail Society Facebook oh boy. group. Oh has boy. even wait, wait for it, made a book all about monorails. Oh my gosh! Trains of the future now arriving which is kind of an awesome title. And uh, Ben Credible does, of course, know Kim and uh, did spend some time with Kim a couple of weeks ago. And just for Kim, because it has nothing to do with us, and this is really just feeding Ben, he made a hyperlapse to the group to view from the monorail gold at Walt Disney World's Epcot line. I believe that's what this is. Go ahead. Thanks, Capcom. Actually, fun little factoid, Kim is also the author of Monorails, Trains of the Future, now arriving. I got one right behind me. Uh, and you can find that on Amazon.com. He's also the owner of the Monorail Society, or creator of the Monorail Society, which you can Google and find more information on. There's a closed Facebook group that I'm a member of. It's really freaking awesome. Uh, and uh, he's just a hardcore monorail nerd, just like I am. So it's uh, really, really awesome to get a comment from Kim. I kind of man crush on him the same way I do uh, Dave Mastiff, just a little bit, because monorails are so cool. If you're a monorail geek, check out his book. Like I said, it's Monorails, Trains of the Future, now arriving uh, and uh, also check out the monorail society and uh, thanks for the comment Kim <laughs> awesome was that live it probably was yeah live right? remote it's, with it's, ben. it felt like you didn't say it good enough you needed to repeat some of that information <laughs> <laughs> I mean I totally watched that video and that's why all those words were stuck in my head yeah. uh, <laughs> in every way see that's what happens even when Ben's not here he's still <laughs> it's like the homunculus. Oh, oh goodness. Oh, boy. I think that's it, right? We're done, right? That's it. We are <laughs> done for 19. <laughs> everybody, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. We will I'm be tomorrow. back next week. Ben will be here, hopefully. Carrie Ann, you will also be here, correct? Yes. Remember correctly? And Space Still Mike. Maybe. You'll be here. I'll be here. I'll be here next week for sure. Okay, sounds good to us. So, thanks for watching 9.14. We hope you have a great day. See you later.